Hi, my name is uh, Gudmeet Manku. This is part 7 of a video series on heart disease. The theme of uh, this video is, uh, do we have cultures in the world with zero heart disease? Published in medical literature. And what do they eat? Uh, in North India, we could ask this question this way. What do you eat? So, Dr. Esselstein has this amazing short paper, four pages long. It's uh, free and online. And it's a succinct summary of his work. I encourage all my friends to just browse through this paper. It reads like a story. Here is a passage. He says, if you as a cardiologist or as a cardiac surgeon decide to set up business or a shop in five of these places in the world, he says you'd better plan on a different profession. Why? <laughs> because these countries do not have cardiovascular disease. That's a very strong statement. So I said, really? Okay, so I will look at the citations. And in this video, I am sharing with you what I discovered. Okay, so we'll start with the Tarahumara Indians uh, who are mentioned in SL Science paper. So I have a personal connection with the Tarahumara Indians as follows. I came across this book called Born to Run written by Christopher McDougall around 2009-2008-2010 uh, time frame. This book describes the Tarahumara Indians and they are super athletes. Okay, um, They are trained to run long distances on uh, rocky mountains from childhood. They can run dozens of miles comfortably. It's not just dozens. Actually, they uh, start competing in events which are 100-200 miles long to be finished in a few days. Okay, So, this book actually gave a big boost to barefoot running and almost barefoot running and shoes like these came in the market. So I got inspired to buy Vibram Five Fingers. I have not tried uh, the Huarache style shoes yet, but I have done dozens of hikes, maybe hundreds in Vibram Five Fingers, including going to Mount Whitney. <laughs> okay. Now, I did discover research papers which uh, verify, yep, coronary heart disease is rare among these people. So what do they eat? Here is a busy slide. The big picture is 94% plant protein and 6% animal protein. Okay. And in terms of the macronutrients, 12% fat. Now somewhere it also says uh, 9 to 12% fat. So about 10% ballpark. Okay. About 10% fat. 10 to 12. Let's look at uh, traditional Okinawans mentioned in Esselstein's paper. So here is the classic paper, 1940s. Okinawan diet had 6% fat. Japan as a whole had 8% fat. Such a low fat percentage. And if we study fish, meat, eggs and dairy, these are animal sources of food, less than 4%, possibly less than 3%. Okay, so 96 to 97% of calories were derived from plant foods. Specifically, and this is <laughs> very curious, sweet potatoes in particular, provided 69% of total calories. And I believe many of them were the purple sweet potato. Okay. What about their coronary heart disease rate? Okay. So here is some data. This is the citation from Esselstein's paper. But in this one, I could find only 1990s data, 1995. So ideally, we should look at uh, 1940s data. Maybe that paper also exists, but I don't, uh, I haven't figured it out. Maybe if you find it, let me know. But let's study what happened in 1995. By this time, Okinawa had changed. Uh, in 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the food habits changed, lifestyle changed. So, you know, the diet was kind of a composite of the traditional Okinawan diet and effects of modernization. So, whatever was happening in that composite population, uh, the number of deaths attributed to coronary heart disease was approximately one-tenth the number of deaths attributed to same coronary heart disease in USA. So they are comparing USA and Okinawa. Okay. And there's also Japan in between. So among the males, it's about one-sixth or one-seventh in that range. So very low coronary heart disease. It's not zero, but it's low. If I could get access to 1940s data, then I guess we can get a better number. But this is the best I got so far. Population number three, rural China mentioned in Esselstein's paper. So this is the citation. And here is a passage. Again, coronary mortality rates in China, 4 versus 67 for men and 3.4 versus 18.9 for women. Look at the contrast. Okay, number of uh, deaths is 1 16th or 1 17th okay, for men. And this is almost uh, 5x to 6x kind of a ratio. Okay, much less. But here is the 
<laughs> very surprising uh, parts. There were a couple of provinces. Uh, uh, they have these names in one of the provinces, uh, in one of these counties. Let's see. No recorded coronary artery disease deaths for males less than 64 years of age in a population of almost a quarter million during a three-year observation period. Amazing. Okay. In the other county, the other province, similar statistics for v women, uh, females less than 64 years of age, uh, among 180,000 females. Okay, so it's amazing. <laughs> okay, and what was the diet like? Well, in the same paper, they say from 1950s to 1980s, uh, three to six percent animal-based food, which means 94 to 96 percent of calories were coming from plants. And look at the fat percentage on the low side, 10 to 12 percent total fat. Okay. Population number four. This is Papua New Guinea. This population has very, very unusual food plates. Uh, let's see. It is mentioned in Esselstein's paper. And here is an article by Dr. John McDougall. This is not a peer-reviewed publication. This is an article at his website. Let's look at the salient points. Sweet potatoes typically supplied over 90% of dietary intake. 90% is coming from that one food, you know, sweet potatoes. And remember the Okinawans were deriving 69% of calories. <laughs> okay, so these are stupendously high percentage of calories coming from just one <laughs> specific food group, sweet potatoes. <laughs> okay, uh, we can call them starch, rich, tuberous vegetables. And you know, in India, we have this phrase called kand mool phal phul patipani. So this is the kand part of this phrase, like shakar kandi and jimmy kand and... Uh, uh, there is ram kand, uh, those kind of vegetables, right? Starch rich tubers. So this is sweet potatoes. Okay, carbohydrates accounted for 94.6% of total energy intake and a mere 3% is being attributed to protein. Okay, so this is <laughs> mind blowing. Okay, so I did find papers like this, which start off like this. Ischemic heart disease was unknown in Papua New Guinea until 1964 when the first case was reported. Since then, there has been a rapid rise. Where? Major urban area the capital, okay? Here is another paper from 1970s. Carbohydrate provided more than 90% of calories. No diabetes, no gout were found by them. Ischemic heart disease was rare, okay? Now, here is a nice book actually by Travel and Burkitt. This goes back to 1980s. Uh, this book is a sort of an anthology of uh, papers, writings by prominent doctors, researchers, epidemiologists. It's a very good piece of work which summarizes what all do we know in different parts of the world in terms of what they started calling Western diseases. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll come to that in a moment, but let's look at the Papua New Guinea chapter and they have uh, passages like this. Atherosclerosis is uncommon. Uh, atherosclerotic heart disease uh, is increasing among the urbanized Papua New Guineans. Little evidence of ischemic heart disease. Okay, this is the fifth population. This is the uh, the one with a lot of data and interesting stories. Uh, let's go through them. Rural Africa, referred to as Central Africa in Dr. Esselstein's paper, but it turns out it's not just Central African countries. Um, it's actually many many countries in Africa. Here is a survey paper, 1997. It's on coronary heart disease and it has epidemiology section. It says numerous reviews have emphasized the rarity of coronary heart disease in Africa, Africa as a whole, okay? Um, especially in the rural parts. And here is a few citations. Uh, 1960, Shaper and Williams considered a CHD, coronary heart disease, to be extremely rare in Uganda. In 1977, Vaughan, this is again a survey paper, described Africans as virtually free of hypertension and coronary heart disease. And then Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, there's a bunch of studies going on. Okay. So here is Dr. Burkitt, his story, and you know, the. Um, uh, he studied African countries, okay, a few of them in detail, and he is also familiar with what's happening in the world around uh, in this area of food, disease, especially uh, uh, so-called Western diseases and the modern chronic lifestyle diseases, okay? So his contribution to our understanding of disease and nutrition is fiber, okay? So he brought fiber into provenance. He educated us through his research and so did a few others, his contemporaries, that fiber is a very, very important constituent that we should pay attention to. So that's why he's remembered as the fiber man. <laughs> okay, there's a book around that theme. So here is a Dr. Gregor video in which we can learn that several non-communicable diseases, uh, including ischemic heart disease, were rare or non-existent. Okay, there's a long list of them. We can read, we can pause the video and see them. Uh, 
And for example, first thousand Kenyan autopsy studies confirmed uh, not a single heart attack. In addition, not a single case of appendicitis, three diabetics out of a thousand, one peptic ulcer, no gallstones, no evidence of high blood pressure. So, you know, uh, very, very healthy population with respect to these health conditions. Here is another passage. Uh, let's read this. Doctors in sub-Saharan Africa during 1930s and 1940s recognized that certain diseases commonly met in Western communities were rare in rural African peasants. And that's why, you know, these diseases started uh, being called Western diseases in several writings. Now, even the teaching manuals stated that, you know, this long list of diseases, let's go through them. Diabetes, coronary heart disease, CHD, appendicitis, peptic ulcer, gallstones, hemorrhoids, constipation, constipation. Uh, this constipation thing is kind of a tip of the iceberg, you know. Uh, uh, if you're getting constipated, then there are correlations with many other health conditions. Uh, were rare in African blacks who, who did what? Who eat foods that contain many skins and fibers, such as beans and corn. And, let's look at this one. Pass a bulky stool two to three times a day. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this sentence that I'm highlighting, it's very long, but it has three parts to it. And these three sentences paint a beautiful story, uh, which is interesting. A bulky stool two to three times a day, that's a lot of stool. And th two to three times a day, and what is leading to such stools? Fiber-rich foods. Uh, Fiber-rich foods coming from beans and corn and many other foods. But uh, their diets had a lot of beans and corn. They will also have tubers. Uh, uh, the starch with tuberous vegetables like cassava, for example. And people who are eating like this, they seem to have very low or zero incidence of many modern chronic lifestyle diseases. So these three are the key points, <laughs> okay, as observed by Burkett and others. So Dr. Burkett has a bunch of quotes. Let's go through them. He says the health of a country's people could be determined by the size of their stools, okay? And then he says, no, if we pass small stools, we'd better have large hospitals, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Okay, let's look at this sentence. These three sentences pack a lot of nutrition insights. Okay, the third sentence is our bodies are adapted to a stone age diet of roots and vegetables because this is what he observed uh, in Africa among the healthiest populations from the perspective of all these NCDs. Now this phrase, diet of roots and vegetables, it reminds me of the Indian way of saying something similar, a food system, which is a peaceful forest dwellers food system, centered around kandamul phalpul patipani. Okay, the, the roots are the kandamul. Okay, okay. And then he says food should not be prepared in fat. That was the other observation uh, that he saw. So what does this mean? So the, he's talking about added fats. So these can be extracts or derivatives of from both plant and animal foods. For example, from plants you can get oils, from animal foods you can get butter or ghee or um, lard for example, okay? So he's saying don't do that, okay? Uh, he's saying get fat from natural foods, okay? Instead of extracts and derivatives. So for example, we could get it from nuts and seeds and trace amounts will come from whole grains and beans also. The frying pan you should give to your enemy, <laughs> okay? So that is a really bad idea, <laughs> okay? All right, so let's come back to our paper that I showed you earlier on Africa. Here is the summary which I have copied uh, to make it more readable. It starts off as follows. He says, uh, coronary heart disease is near absent in rural areas in Africa, okay? But changes are happening. Among the town dwellers, fat intake is going up and fiber containing foods are reducing. So higher in fat, lower in fiber. These are the two pain points they're observing. And then they're expressing concern with these changes um, and how and lifestyle changes like these, we can expect urban Africans, you know, coronary heart disease is likely to rise. But then comes this interesting last two sentences. They say, as long as Africa remains impoverished, a major rise in CHD is unlikely. What does this mean? It's a sad statement. What's going on is rural Africa, where all those low NCDs and a few of the NCDs were zero, they had a low fat, high fiber diet, but with affluence, you know, it starts becoming high fat, low fiber. Urbanization, modernization is associated with both dietary changes and a rise in NCDs. So they are saying, as long as we remain rural, we will not have these NCDs, but wait a minute, okay. As urbanized uh, modern dwellers, not just Africa, this, this phenomenon is happening all over the world in many parts of the world, okay, it's not just Africa. As a 
modernization, urbanization happens, we can choose to eat like this, low fat, high fiber, just like rural parts of Africa and other rural parts of the world used to do. It's a choice we have. But let's go back to this paper. The paper says prevention by urging reversion to previous lifestyle behavior is a non-starter. Basically what they're saying is urban modernized people do not have like a pro- like a propensity for this. They just don't want to do it. <laughs> now this is where difficulties arise. We can, but it requires a lot of effort. Okay. So diseases of affluence is the term that got coined uh, based on the observations in Africa and other parts of the world that I told you. And that's why this is called disease of rich people and Western disease paradigm came into the picture. In India, we can call it Amiro Ki Bimaria. Okay. Uh, the follow-up video, I will demonstrate to you that the phrase is applicable to India. A bunch of these diseases like uh, NCDs, like di- type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, obesity, hypertension, I'll walk us through all four and I will show you within India, uh, c- contemporary statistics will show us it increases with wealth, <laughs> it increases with literacy, it increases with urbanization. Okay, I'll show you all these trends, they do happen in India. So this is totally relevant uh, uh, as a description of what is happening in India. Okay, I'll show you in the next video. And I'm just giving you glimpses of uh, follow-up videos that I'm making and we will see how the food plates change worldwide, not just India. This is a 1962 study, 85 countries were studied and they studied, you know, countries with low GDP per capita. Uh, and what do they eat? What does their food plate look like? What do countries with high GDP per capita? These are the richer countries. How do they construct food plates? And in between, what happens? This is a big picture in terms of the uh, uh, fats, carbohydrates and proteins and also the constituents. Uh, if you look at all these details. So I'll walk us through this in subsequent videos. I'm just giving you a glimpse that uh, uh, that was observed in 60s, uh, again observed in 1980s in this uh, paper by Burkett. Uh, it's the same concept and then he explains in detail what's going on. Uh, the same uh, trends are being observed in 2001 because you know the entire world has not become uniform yet. We still have variations and changes are happening. So we can observe changes as they're happening even today. <laughs> it's the same changes and Wikipedia actually summarizes all these four changes. These are the four dietary factors. We can succinctly see them as higher consumption of oil and refined sugars, higher consumption of animal foods instead of plant foods, higher consumption of refined grains instead of whole grains, higher consumption of ultra processed foods instead of, you know, uh, uh, taking ingredients, fresh ones from the market and making food at home. And all these UPFs, ultra processed foods often uh, have refined grains in them, some sugar and oil in them, or if they are made of animal foods, uh, you know, they, they are actually composed of one, two and three in a large way, often, <laughs> not always, often. Okay, and these changes, as I will walk you through a series of videos, I'm making a 28 part series to explain all this in detail as to how all this is happening with respect to heart disease. This leads to low fiber, high fat. Okay, so let's do a recap of uh, this entire video. I found this paper by Dr. Esselstein, a succinct summary of his work, very elegant, uh, nicely done. Uh, with amazing results. I really request people to go read it. Like what has he demonstrated? And he referred to these five populations. So in this video, I went deeper. What do these populations eat? And do they experience low or zero cardiovascular disease, specifically coronary heart disease? And this is the big picture, which I will explain in subsequent videos. The number one killer of men and women is heart disease, and it's virtually non-existent. And luckily, a few interventional studies got done. So, uh, Ornish and Esselstein took uh, people in USA. Uh, they were quite sick uh, uh, in the Esselstein study. Uh, I'll, I'll go to details later. And he showed stunning results. <laughs> okay, and that's why uh, these are the food guidelines as to, as to how we could copy uh, these populations that I just told you in the modern world as a modern urban dweller. And he started saying heart disease is a foodborne disease. Okay, I wish more people knew all this. Okay, so I'm writing articles at Thankful to Plants. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share. Uh, Thank you so much.